I was charged today with trying to uh, to set some initial foundation or or, or groundwork information for uh, the higher level talks that you'll you'll hear later this afternoon, and so it's called genetics and genomics, uh, uh, and again the basics. And so I'm going to try to get a few things accomplished. I'm going to try to describe to you. Uh, I'm a I, I call myself a molecular geneticist. Um, what that means is that we're interested in a particular molecule. It turns out to be the DNA molecule. But I'm going to try to frame for you what molecular genetics is. And then uh, I'm going to kind of go back a little bit. You guys are familiar with uh, quantitative traits, perhaps. Uh, these are most of the traits that we, uh, uh, we, we generate our economic, uh, our income from, uh, traits that are controlled by uh, uh, a number of different genes. And we're going to talk about the relationship between this inheritance pattern of these genes and something called heritability and why heritability becomes important in selection for, uh, for cattle. Uh, and then uh, I'm going to talk about the genomic tools and how those relate to uh, this concept of heritability and selection. And then if there's any time left, which I'll try to make sure there's not, uh, uh, you can ask me questions. So I want to start real, real basic and uh, try, to, try to tell you, uh, so let's define the term phenotype. Phenotype is uh, something you can see, the outward appearance of an individual, uh, a weight that you take or uh, uh, you know, an ultrasound measurement that you take. That's phenotype, that's what you see, okay? But what we need to realize is that phenotype is actually composed of two main uh, components. There's a genetic component, okay, and I'm going to try to tell you about how genes control uh, phenotype. And then there's, uh, particularly in the traits that we're interested in, there's an environmental component. And it's these two things together that actually result in what you see in your animals uh, uh, individually. <clears throat> the second part I want to uh, talk about is uh, what we're trying to do in, in cattle, what you try to do as a breeder, is uh, you, you have a goal. Hopefully you've set a goal where you're going to say, I want to increase my weaning weights. I want to increase my quality grade. I want to uh, decrease my birth weights. With that goal in mind, what you're trying to do is you're trying to pick parents to breed together to produce offspring that have increased genetic merit. Okay? Uh, and we, we, we do this lots and lots of ways. Uh, some people just simply go out and, and look at the animal. Oh, yeah, that's a good looking bull. That's a good looking cow, and I think I'm going to breed those together. Uh, you know, along with that, you measure a few traits. Well, this one had the highest yearling weight, and that's what I'm going for, so I'm going to use him. Uh, if you're in a situation where you might be a commercial producer and uh, you're raising crossbred cattle, you might pick them based on some general qualities associated with different breeds. I want to take Charlet because I want to I want to add some growth and I want to add some ability to convert to protein. I want to use uh, for let's just say Angus for maternal ability, quality grade. Okay, so you might pick them on complementarity. You might pick them on uniformity. I want them all to look alike, so I'm going to go out there and, and, and measure my measurement and, and make them all look alike. For the last uh, 40 or 50 years, uh, and this is different for each kind of segment of the industry and particularly for the difference between dairy and beef, we've had these, these tools that we call uh, EPDs, or expected progeny differences. And what these tools do is they take all the information that you collect and uh, are used to make a prediction about the genetic merit of an individual. And so you get a numerical value that represents the potential uh, value or merit uh, uh, of an individual for reaching your selection goals. The last one down here is a relatively new one. And that's what uh, the other speakers are going to talk about today is uh, we're coming to a time, and in fact the time is here, where we actually can actually look at the DNA of an individual and 
try to make a prediction about its genetic merit. And if we can distill that information down uh, to where it's useful for you guys as producers, uh, then of course we all believe that uh, that accelerates accelerates your ability to produce that best offspring, whatever your best is, okay? So, uh, a little bit of introduction to this thing called genomics. Uh, so, it's not a scary word. Uh, it, it's, uh, genome simply is, uh, uh, means all genes, okay? The word ohm or the suffix ohm means uh, all, and uh, gen is, of course, genes. And the reason why we say genomics is that it's all of the DNA material, all of the genes in an individual that work together in concert, okay, to produce the phenotype that you see, okay. Uh, within most mammalian genomes, uh, there's about 3 billion DNA base pairs, okay. And within those 3 billion DNA base pairs, there's information encoded for 25,000 or so things we call genes. And it's these genes that actually, uh, through their expression, go out and perform various functions through the development of individuals. Okay? And so you can see how, uh, you know, the growth of an individual uh, probably takes, you know, lots and lots of these genes. Not probably. It does take lots and these, lots of these genes acting together in concert to allow that individual to, uh, to grow, okay? So, a uh, little bit of an important thing here. Does that work, Bob? Yeah, it works. So there's three billion DNA base pairs in one copy of a genome. Uh, you all know that uh, half the genetic material comes from dad, half the genetic material comes from mom. So in all the cells except for sperm cells and egg cells, there's six billion uh, DNA base pairs. I want you to think about that number when we cover the next couple slides. There's six billion DNA base pairs, okay? It's a big number. A little bit further definition of molecular genetics. As a molecular geneticist, what I'm interested in is looking at those individual genes and trying to figure out what they do. That's one, okay? Of those 25,000 different genes, I'd kind of like to know how they are influencing uh, how that individual develops. The second part is, is that we know that there are differences in the DNA sequences between individuals. And it turns out that those differences, or what we try to understand is how those differences change phenotype, okay? So this is the first time I'll try to reinforce for you that changes in the DNA sequence are in some ways, depending on where the change is at, responsible for the variation, the genetic variation that we see in the population. Okay, that's very, that's very essential for what you're gonna to hear today. Changes in the DNA molecule have the ability to influence changes in the phenotype of the individual, okay? So, we'll give you a couple examples. This is a pretty easy example, and I had to go find a Charlotte cow, so if this is, Actually, if this is somebody in this room, Charlotte Cow, <laughs> thank Google. You have a very good presence in Google because this cow is one of the first ones, first good looking Charlotte Cow on the list. There's, for some reason, Europeans get a lot of Charlotte Cows pictured, and I, I don't see the attraction. But this is a really nice uh, Charlotte female. I don't mean to be, uh, you know, this is, a, this is not a difficult question, this is an easy question. What's the obvious difference between these two animals? Color. One's black and one's uh, white. How many DNA base pairs out of six billion do I got to change to change that cow from black to white? How many? I got six billion. How many do I got to change to change that cow from black to white? One. Okay. One DNA base pair. This happens to be a, a, a variation, a DNA variation in a gene that's called silver. The reason why it's called silver is it does the same thing in lots of different species, in particular it does that in mice. So normal mice are brownie color and then those that carry the silver gene are guess what? Same color as Charlet cattle. They're kind of a silvery white. Okay? So that kind of, 
I hope frames what we're dealing with. We have six billion DNA base pairs. On average, uh, pairs of individuals, uh, if you take two individuals, they may differ at over 600,000 of those six billion DNA base pairs. Okay? So that tells us about what kind of variation we see in our population or we can expect in our population. So as a genetic molecular geneticist, I actually think it's pretty remarkable that just from a visual observation standpoint, I only take, you need to change one DNA base pair out of six billion to make that remarkable change in phenotype, black versus white. This one might be a little bit more difficult. Again, the one on the left, somebody might own part of it here. He's relative, there you go. I wasn't planning that, but he's good looking though. Uh, and Gen X has a great presence on the internet. Um, anybody tell me the difference between these two? It it's, should be obvious, but anybody wanna? The one over there on the right, muscling, okay? On average, those cattle there, we call it double muscling, you guys are probably familiar with it. Uh, lean meat yield be about four to six percent, lean meat yield be about four to six percent more in the guy on the right, steers from the guy on the right versus the guy on the left. Four to six percent more muscle. How many DNA base pairs out of a billion or six billion do I gotta change to get four to six more percent muscle? Okay. In this case, it's one, okay? So again, I think that that's pretty remarkable. DNA polymorphism can significantly change. Changes in the DNA sequence can significantly change the phenotype of the individual, okay? Now, both of these things are what we call simple genes. Uh, the traits are controlled by 100% genetics. Uh, so that va DNA variation is the controlling factor for the change in phenotype. Uh, there's no environmental influence, et cetera. Um, and and it's, it's, it's kind of a, I shouldn't oversimplify it like that, but I think those examples are fairly remarkable. But those are, are simple, single gene genetic control. What we're more interested in, and the traits that will be talked about the rest of the day, are quite a bit more complex than that. Okay, they're the quantitative traits. And quantitative traits are, uh, we define them as being controlled by many genes, and in fact they are. Uh, and the added feature of quantitative traits is oftentimes these traits are, not oftentimes, all the time, these traits are controlled by environment. Okay, so the uh, idea being that uh, I can have a great high genetic merit individual for, for growth, uh, but if I don't feed him very much, then I'm not, he's not going to realize that genetic potential, right? So that's a trait that's, that's quantitative, controlled by lots of genes, and there's always also this significant uh, environmental influence on, on the trait. Uh, the reason why we're concerned about these is, again, these are all the traits that you get dollars for. You get dollars for extra pounds of calf, et cetera. Here's just a comparison of the difference between these simple traits over here on this side and, and quantitative, quantitative traits on this side. Uh, and the way you can tell the difference is, is that uh, if it's a trait that you have to measure versus like if you have to say red or black, well, that's simple. Uh, weaning weight, do they only come in like two types? I mean, if you're, if you're using a really, really old scale, it might come in small, medium, and large. Okay, but uh, typically uh, we have this continuous, which is the next thing down here, this distribution of values. Okay, so when you wean your calves and weigh them, you got all the way from, let's say, 450 pounds to 650 pounds, right? Again, they're controlled by many genes and uh, influenced by environment, and over here, they're not. So let's just further define these, uh, these genes that control these quantitative traits. <clears throat> Typically, uh, each of these genes actually controls a fairly small amount of the variation in the trait. Okay, so there's tens to maybe hundreds of them, and each of them uh, may contribute a very small portion of the variance. Now that differs, there's some of them that contribute a little bit more than others, and et cetera, but typically they have a relatively small effect on the trait. 
and it's the cumulative, uh, it's the combination of all the different variations uh, within those genes that give you that phenotype, okay? So it's all these genes working together that give you that, that, that trait that you're measuring. And so uh, to deal with those kind of traits, uh, we deal with them in the form of things like EPDs, uh, but those based on population means and variances. And that's not terribly important except for that, uh, the next couple slides I'm going to talk about have to do with things called statistical distributions, which I'm sure you're all excited about yeah. hearing about. I'll try to go, through, go as fast as I can so I don't lose anybody to sleep and not to, you know. This is just a really simplified example of uh, basically the difference between a simple trait and maybe one of these traits that control that is a quantitative trait. Uh, most of you are familiar with the Punnett square, uh, where you uh, take two individuals, a male and a female, and you draw a little box, and you can bring the letters down and everything. If you make two individuals that are what's called heterozygous, so two different <coughs> alleles or two different variations <coughs> at a gene, together, uh, you basically get this distribution, this one to two to one. Okay, and that's really simple, easy categories. So for instance, I'll use the coat color example. If you take uh, um, two Smokies and breed them together, you get a black one, you get a couple Smokies, and you get one that's probably more typically colored like your Char or your red Charlotte, okay? You see, uh, that's because there's only these combinations of, of these alleles. These big A and little a are, are variants of the same gene. As you increase to three genes, you can see the number of categories increases. 10 genes, number of categories increases. 20 genes, you can see the number of categories begins to increase quite rapidly. And then if I lay environmental impact or influence on that, the reason why your weaning weights come out ranging all the way from 450 to 650 pounds is because it's following this kind of distribution like this, okay? Because of all these factors. That's not really that important. What's important is, again, that because phenotype is controlled by both genotype and environment, uh, what we need to do when we, when we select our animals, we need to try to figure out uh, how to precisely define what's genetic and what's phenotypic. Or, sorry, what's genetic and what's environmental, okay? And so uh, it's this relationship that I'll spend probably a little, the next little bit on trying to, trying to tell you about the relationship between genotype and phenotype. In quantitative genetics, we have a term we call heritability. And that tries to define for you uh, how much of the variation that you're seeing is due to genetics. Okay? Heritability just, whoops. Heritability, although it's abbreviated this way, is actually the proportion of variance due to genetics over the total amount of variance that you're seeing. Okay? Uh, that's, I don't need mean to say it that way, but that's what it is. What's more important is, let's just look at a few traits here. These are carcass traits. You can estimate through experimental uh, methods uh, and taking measurements, you can estimate heritability. And if you look at these traits here, you can see that on average they have values about 40%. That 0.4 or 0.39 to 0.4 means that about 40% of the variation that we see in these traits is due to genetics. The other 60% is due to phenotype, right? Because we said that the variance is composed of both genetic variance and phenotypic variance. Okay? These are really, these are moderately heritable. That's a night that's actually a fairly decent heritability. But how that relates is, let's say this is a population, and I have my population of, of calves that uh, I've measured for, let's say, ribeye area. And I have ones down here that have small ribeye area, and I have ones up here that have big ribeye area, 
and I have ones here that have average ribeye area. And I'm wanting to make a lot of progress in terms of ribeye area in my breeding program. What you do is you go pick the parents that have big ribeye areas, right? If you make animals with big ribeye areas together, in, in theory, you should get big ribeye areas in those calves, right? So what happens? You pick a bunch of animals up here, you mate them together, and they produce offspring. And next year you go by and you measure those offspring, you take ribeye measurements, and you get this same kind of range. You get small ones down here and big ones up here, and you think, well, man, I made it big to big, and they didn't all turn out big. Uh, and, you know, even though I look at the average, I made a little bit of progress in my average. They all got a little tiny bit bigger on average, but I'm certainly not getting big all the time. That's heritability. That's heritability because some of these animals up here were big, had big ribeyes due to environmental effects. Some of them up here had big ribeyes due to genetic effects. When you mated those together, the only response you can really see in the same environment is the genetic response. Okay? So that's why progress in some of these traits is slow, is because heritability or the proportion of uh, variants that's controlled by genetics is low. So like I said, these traits, that's a relatively high. Some of the traits that, that uh, Dr. Taylor will talk to you about this afternoon are half that. Okay? So you can get an idea of why it takes so long to make progress in selection. So let's go on here. I'm hoping Dan's going to tell me I'm running out of time. How do we, ch how do we change the ability to identify those animals that have high genetic merit for the traits that we're interested in. How we change that is increasing the, our ability uh, to determine an animal's genotype. Okay, so if we're selecting directly on genotype, we're more likely to get the genetic progress that we're interested in. The problem is, is that uh, the measurements we, we use are only, uh, they're only predictors of true genotype. And I'll give you kind of a silly example. Uh, do you think you make more progress in reducing birth weight in your herd by using eye scales or digital scales? Really? Digital ones. Eye scales aren't very accurate, right? Some guys might think they're accurate. No, oh, that's 80 pounds or 92, okay? So the accuracy of that measurement actually is related to the accuracy of identifying that individual's genetic merit. And we might use some of the most accurate, I mean ultrasound technology as an example, highly accurate. But in the end, there's still this, this environmental variance that we don't, we can't deal with. The best thing we can do is put them in the same environment and measure as, as accurately as we can, okay? So the idea is here is that if we have these, this kind of discrepancy or this uh, lower correlation between the phenotype we see and the actual genotype of the individual, how do we improve that? And the answer is, or at least we believe is molecular genesis, the answer is, is the ability to actually use DNA technologies to identify the actual genetic uh, merit of an individual. And that's what I'll, I'll briefly introduce and then I'll, and I'll be quiet and let, let the guys uh, tell you some uh, more interesting things. You all know that, that in the last two decades, maybe you don't know this, but uh, this concept is not, I'll say, a new concept, uh, whether it be with human uh, genetics and genomics or animal genetics and genomics. Uh, the scientific community has been interested in understanding how DNA variation relates to phenotype, whether it be in humans and the biomedical interest, et cetera, or whether it be in livestock and understanding the physiology and the biology of our livestock at that very, very fundamental basic level. 
okay? So for about 20 years now, actually more, uh, we've had uh, livestock genetic, uh, genetics and genomics programs. Uh, and uh, back in 2004 was the, the first uh, draft of the, of the bovine genome, the cow genome. Um, and since then it's continually improved, but uh, along with that we've, we've uh, had new technology platforms become available where actually we can go and very accurately uh, uh, genotype uh, individuals for lots and lots of variation within the DNA. Uh, and some of the latest, you've, you guys might be familiar with uh, uh, DNA chip or SNP technology, uh, some of the newest uh, platforms allow us to genotype uh, between 50,000 and, and 800,000 markers per animal with a, just a small DNA sample, okay? And it's those technologies you'll hear about uh, a lot more this afternoon. I'm gonna skip that over time. The idea behind these technologies is, is that we can genotype individuals, we can take the phenotypic measurements from those individuals, and we can try to uh, associate the different genotypes and all the different markers, the tens of thousands of markers, with the particular trait. And this is a really simple example, and I'm not going to, there's better data that you're going to see this afternoon. This is an example of a project we had here at the university for five years in association with the Simitol uh, Association. We fed lots of cattle here for the Simitol Association, similar to what you're doing now. Uh, but these cattle all came from their sire evaluation herds, and we had complete records on those, or phenotypic records on those. We generated 50,000, or 50K is what you're probably familiar with, genotypes on, on several thousand animals, and then we did some association analysis. And that's what this graph here uh, indicates. Each one of those little dots is an individual genetic marker. Uh, and across the bottom, you see those numbers, that's cows have 29, uh, non-sex chromosomes and so you see the 29 there and then this uh, scale on this side uh, is a measure of statistical uh, association with the particular marker and trait and uh, what this one is, this is birth weight and basically anything above about, well anything above about right here uh, there's an association between marker genotype and phenotype. And the one that I'm going to point out here, this is another one that kind of bends those rules about each gene being responsible for just a small amount of the variation. Uh, there's actually a gene underneath here uh, that in this population is uh, responsible for about 7% of the variation in birth weight. Okay? And I don't have to know exactly what the DNA sequence variation is that causes that. I'd like to know it, but I don't have to know it because I have these genetic markers that are telling me that there's that gene there and there's that variation there, okay? And what you can do is you can take these associations, and I think Dr. Weber's going to tell you about that, and uh, harness that information into a product that you guys can use to improve your breeding program. Uh, I don't think you necessarily care about this. Um, I'm going to skip that. Uh, and I'm going to skip that because I bet you I've talked too long. Um, three take home points. Understand that DNA sequence variation is directly related to phenotype variation. Understand that genomic technologies are what we're trying to use to make the predictive uh, the, the accuracy of, of that genetic evaluation uh, higher. And uh, I'm glad that you're all here today, the last point. I'm glad you're all here today because uh, this, I believe this technology does work. You're going you're gonna to see examples of that. Uh, and, and you really uh, should be applauded for coming and, uh, and increasing your knowledge about how to use this, this technology. Uh, and if you do that, I think that there's some, some big advantages coming. So I'm going to be quiet um, and get us back on schedule.